Beers with Engineers. Uh, <clears throat> we're really, really excited. We've got some great stuff to chat about with you guys today. Uh, I am going to pour myself, I don't know if you can see that very well, but I've got an Admiral Abyss from Odd 13 Brewing. It is a chocolate milk stout. They're a little local Colorado brewery that has awesome artwork on their cans and really good beer too. So that's what I'm doing. Will, what are you pouring there? I have a Joanne IPA from a uh, local brewery called Browns in the uh, Troy, New York area. Nice. Well, so we do have to start off with, and I'll let you kind of run from there, but we'll start off with, you know, the good old safe harbor notice, right? Some of the stuff we're going to talk about here today is not yet released. You know, don't make any stock purchasing decisions around anything that we have to say. So, Will, why don't you run us through the agenda and then we'll talk through the rest of what we got going on. Sounds good. Okay. Um, welcome to our second installment of uh, Cloud Native Beers with Engineers. We uh, don't stand on a lot of formality, so we have a, a pretty minimalist agenda and it's, it's certainly meant to be dynamic. Feel free to raise your hand, throw questions in the Q&A or chat window as they come up. Um, or feel free to come off mute and just uh, give a shout. So why are we here? So the goal is to try and um, try and promote some exchange of information and knowledge and lessons learned between those of us at ServiceNow and our customers who are exploring the the cloud native world, implementing. Um, various XAAS services, facilities, platforms, and um, to try and try and um, discover ways that ServiceNow can make that journey easier. Good. Who are we? Yeah, so Mike Gallagher, uh, I'm an advisory solution architect on the uh, America's West um, ITX commercial team. Uh, been in IT for 25 plus years. Uh, I've done everything on its own. Uh, if it's got ones and zeros in it, I've probably sort of had a hand in it at some point. Um, I uh, love what I do. Um, I love talking about technology and using technology to solve business problems. Um, I love helping customers um, solve problems, right? <clears throat> And, and just kind of side note a little bit about me. Um, I've got a wonderful wife and four amazing kids. So uh, never a dull moment around my house. Um, I train Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and uh, I play a lot of board games, not only with my family, but also with my friends. I'm Will Hallam. I'm an advisory solution architect for ITOM in the commercial uh, vertical. I've been in technology for more years than I can count and working primarily in IT infrastructure, started as uh, kind of an early on Unix person and then just branched into all kinds of variations of IT infrastructure, systems engineering, most recently doing a lot of things in the cloud, uh, especially automating a lot of repetitive cloud related tasks via via service now and in my spare time i like to hang out with my family uh play a little hockey now and again and uh probably way too much time on video games our first topic in the technical deep dive section of the program is just going to compare and contrast some of the methods that are available for discovering kubernetes clusters and there's three primary methods. One is to use our out-of-the-box discovery patterns, which have been available for several releases now. And they can communicate with the API endpoint for any Kubernetes control plane, whether that's sitting in a cloud, um, roll your own, 
if it's a mini cube running on you know a, a Raspberry Pi under your desk, um, we can talk to it with with the uh, these discovery patterns. The second option is something called cloud native operations. Cloud native operations is uh, available in the innovation lab of our store. It's going GA later this year. And what that does is that actually creates uh, a couple sidecar containers in your Kubernetes cluster, which contain our agent client collector and a mid server. And those two containers push both uh, visibility data, the things you would typically get via discovery, as well as various metrics that are available by querying things like Prometheus and Istio into your ServiceNow instance. And then the, the third method is the automated discovery pattern. And what that is, is uh, a new functionality that started rolling out with the current store release of, of patterns, which discovers cloud-based Kubernetes. So if it's discovering a, 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 a Google Cloud, for example, and there are GKE clusters in that cloud account, in that cloud project, the automated discovery pattern will pull in the information about those clusters and automatically create a discovery schedule to discover that cluster for you, which if you are looking to have a large scale deployment of a lot of Kubernetes clusters in a cloud account, this can save a lot of time in terms of setting up your discovery credentials and establishing your discovery schedule. Okay, here are the uh, pros and cons for manual discovery patterns. Uh, the, the big pro is it's our most mature solution. It's completely you know, fully supported, whereas um, the uh, other two solutions are, are newer. The downside is the fact that it requires a one-to-one -one, uh, credential in many cases. Uh, we, we, we are hearing from customers who use a tool such as Rancher to manage their clusters and have found that they can configure a credential at the rancher level, which can then apply to multiple clusters. But in general, there's a need to have a credential defined for each cluster that you're going to discover. It also requires two separate schedules. The documentation for setting this up instructs you to create a cluster discovery schedule, which runs the Kubernetes cluster pattern that queries basically every single object inside your Kubernetes cluster. And because that can be, um, that, that can be not a short running operation in a, a cluster that's very large, the recommendation is run that a daily, perhaps twice a day. And then we have a second pattern, which is called the event pattern that just pulls in a, a set of recent Kubernetes events based on, it, you know, basically it does a baseline the first time it runs, it stores the date of the most recent event entry that it pulls. And then when it runs subsequently, it just pulls new events that occurred from that last runtime. And, and so that runs more quickly. It parses through the events for pods that went away, pods that were instantiated, et cetera, during that time window between um, the current run and the previous run, and then updates your CMDB accordingly. But again, it's a bit of a con because if you've got a lot of clusters, you've got to establish those schedules for each cluster. And the, uh, the out-of-the-box pattern supports um, using a containerized MID, a standard MID, and as I mentioned, it, it can point at any Kubernetes endpoint. So if you've got Kubernetes clusters running in AKS, EKS, GKE, you can point these discovery patterns at those and the pattern will successfully inventory and update your CMDB against those clusters. Bottom line, this will probably discover almost whatever you need to discover, but it doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles. It's, you know, kind of the, the baseline configuration and needs a bit of, of <clears throat> management and handholding. Great summary, Mike. Cloud native ops. So the pros on this are it, it's very easy to deploy. It um, you're provided with 
a standard manifest that you can apply to a Kubernetes cluster and Kubernetes just takes it from there. It establishes a mid server and an ACC agent and those automatically phone home into your instance based on parameters that you pass into the, uh, into the deployment. It includes metric ingestion. So in addition to just updating your CMDB, it's feeding metrics in, which you can then use to um, alert responsible parties when something goes out of whack in your cluster. It also enables things like traffic and tag-based service mapping. So it kind of, it can provide a, a leg up, a shortcut to establishing service maps against what you've got running in, in Kubernetes. And another big plus, there's no credentials management required because it's a push back into the, um, back into your instance via the sidecar mid server. The, the cons, it, it is coming, GA is coming later this year. It's not yet GA, which just means that um, if, you know, our, our recommendation is not to run it with, you know, mission critical workloads, because if push comes to shove and you need support on it, all the various underpinnings of full production level support are not quite there for it yet. Scaling um, can be, scaling is a consideration. If you have a hundred clusters running cloud native ops against those hundred clusters would mean you'd have a hundred mid servers showing up on your instance. And so you'd want to, you know, be cognizant of your current instance sizing and probably work with your uh, account and support team to make sure that you're sized appropriately for the number of mid servers that you'd be looking to um, stand up before you just blasted this out to you know a, a large a large scale deployment of, of kubernetes clusters and it, it does rely on you having things like prometheus and istio in order for it to get the full set of metrics back so you'd want to kind of look at your current design what the current kubernetes plugin um, standards within your organization are and make sure, you know, kind of marry those up against what cloud native ops is looking for and, and, and get a, an accurate picture of what the full value add would be, again, before you just kind of blast it out there to a, a lot of containers. Uh, cloud native ops, because of the way it functions, it does require, you know, it only works with that containerized turnkey mid that it stands up as part of the deployment, fully functional within AKS, EKS, GKE, or any kind of Kubernetes cluster you can you can come up with, really. And a quick point, um, <clears throat> Adam had asked about um, in the Q and A about support for OpenShift uh, for the manual patterns, and I had just forgotten we we do currently support OpenShift and when we put this slide deck together, I just totally forgot that, so I wanted to make sure we called that out um, as part of this as well. So, yeah, great call, Mike. There is uh, specifically an OpenShift plugin, which does, which is included as part of the out of the box, uh, regular Kubernetes pattern, which will look for OpenShift to be present on that cluster endpoint. And if it's there, it can pull in the OpenShift specific items. Automated discovery pattern. So this is a new functionality. We've started rolling out with the current store release of the uh, discovery patterns app, which is 1.0.89. Um, and what this means is it's kind of a, a synergy between cloud discovery and Kubernetes dis discovery. And so starting with GKE, when a GKE cluster is discovered, this pattern will create a discovery schedule for that cluster. And then when that schedule runs, it will use cloud API commands to extract a, an appropriate credential that it can use to perform the discovery. And um, so this has a benefit of making scalability a lot easier. You're no longer having to manually create schedules for individual clusters. And um, just kind of the, the dynamic nature of the cloud marries up a lot, a lot better with this type of approach as opposed to having to have some kind of uh, process off to the side where you are constantly reconciling your discovery schedule against what 
cloud-based Kubernetes clusters you have provisioned in your environment. Uh, this will work with either a containerized mid or a standard plain old mid server. Uh, current support is EKS and GKE currently available in the store release. And the July store release is planned to have this functionality available for AKS. Yeah, and actually, that's a good point. This deck is wrong, and we'll make sure to update that because they actually got it into the April store release before the May store release. Um, so this is this is now currently live uh, for EKS and GKE as of the 1.0.89 um, discovery and service mapping patterns update. And then this is just a really high level. We don't need to walk through this, but this is kind of a just real quick snapshot. You know, we'll provide this deck to everyone um, <clears throat> after we're done here, but that way you can have a real quick snapshot to understand what the various methods are, what the pros and cons are, and, and you know, what, what potentially would be the best, you know, um, solution for you. Any, any questions about the various um, methods before we shift on to the automated configuration and deployment portion? You guys have been doing great throwing uh, questions in the Q and A, so keep doing that. And don't you know? Don't hesitate if you'd like to come off mute, raise your hand, and you can ask your question that way as well. Hey, Mike. While you're switching over to your uh, your auto mid segment, I'm just going to pop up the uh, first poll. Okay. Just a, a quick uh, poll, just to garner some feedback from you folks about. Um, what you're doing today for mid servers and what your initial thoughts would be on the uh, concept of automatically deploying and retiring mid servers in your environment. And then also just trying to get a flavor for what, um, what your most commonly deployed cloud resource is outside of VMs. So you mm -hmm. should see a poll up on your screen. If you can take a couple minutes to jam through those questions, Raise your hand if you don't see the poll. <laughs> yeah, if you don't see the poll, please. Uh... Oh, we're starting to see answers come on in. Perfect. So <clears throat> while you guys are looking through that, I'll talk through a bit on... Uh, so uh, Mike had a question around... Michael Hunt had a question around the, um, the cloud native ops. Uh, the estimated GA. What I'm hearing is Q3, Q4, but that's super fuzzy depending upon other roadmap things. The automatic discovery capabilities, GKE and EKS are actually live now, and uh, Azure AKS is expected to be July. The other thing about cloud native ops is, um, as with a lot of you know enhancements in, in service now, a lot of it is driven on customer feedback. So if, for example, cloud native ops, the idea of cloud native ops really resonates with you, feel free to drop us a note and we can kind of, you know, use that potentially to add fuel to the fire and let the business unit know, you know, we've got this level of interest in that um, to potentially, you know, kind of get a more solid uh, GA plan in, in, in place for that functionality. Yeah, agreed. Great point. So this is this is the part where we talk about my background and why I have my background up here today. So my background is from a, a video game called Satisfactory, which is all about building and making a completely automated factory floor that you know builds and deploys more stuff. So um, it's a really kind of fun and, and interesting game. Be very careful; it's easy to go down the rabbit hole, um, but it um, it absolutely you know, relates to what we're talking about today, which is kind of automatically deploying and configuring more mid servers. Um, and the, the whole, like why we did this is, let's say you're a customer that has a significant amount of infrastructure that you need to discover and you need to be able to discover it in a timely manner, right? You can't have a discovery process go for days and days and days and days and days and days. And so as a result, you may need a significant amount of mid servers in order to scale that 
capability up and your capacity up in order to be able to discover your components uh, within a reasonable time frame. However, over time, that could be incredibly costly if you're doing that in a, uh, you know, an AWS environment and you're running these all as EC2 instances. The, you know, having the you know, 30 EC2 instances running full time just so that you can discover stuff at night could be costly. So the, the concept here is to automate the scale up and scale down of containerized mid servers so that you can dramatically increase or shrink your discovery capacity as needed. So this is a quick kind of high level overview of the architecture and we'll kind of walk through the whole process um, as I kind of show you what it looks like. Um, and um, so the, the first thing we need to do and I'm not going to cover this today, but um, I, I just posted a blog article on how on, on this entire process start to finish and what I did in order to get to this point. Um, so we'll make sure we send out the link to that blog article uh, as part of the follow up to this. <clears throat> but the first thing you have to do is you have to prepare, prepare your instance for TLS, TLS based mutual auth, right, um, which is something that is <clears throat> a little bit of a tweak. And the bottom line, from a customer perspective, you'll just open a support case and say, hey, we need to set up TLS-based mutual auth, and the support team will go through and do all the necessary components in order to ensure that's up and working for you. Once you've got that completed, um, you'll go through kind of the, <clears throat> the, the preparation of the TLS certificate chain. And I'll, I'll dive into that, and we'll get more into kind of the how in a minute. But first, I'm going to take a step back and talk about the architecture, right? So what you're seeing here on the screen is here are the components in the ServiceNow instance that sort of make up the capability to do this. So we have to build out profiles for the mid server. We have to build out the request um, record, right? And then we pass it over to what's called a deployment mid server. A deployment mid server is a mid server that's already on the Kubernetes infrastructure that has the capability to deploy resources on that Kubernetes infrastructure. It then goes and deploys the rest of the mid servers automatically for you. And then the same thing occurs when you delete them and it scales down. So we'll kind of quickly review what it looks like. So from a, a, a profile perspective, this is, hey, this is what I want these mid servers to look like and be configured as once they're finally deployed. So things like, what what ServiceNow instance should they be connecting up to? And, you know, uh, on the wrapper configs, you know, it's, you know, Java heap size and things like that. Um, if you want them to come up and be clustered together, you can have that be configured. You can configure their capabilities. All of the normal mid-server um, configuration options are there as part of these profiles. So you can build that profile and then use that profile to instantiate your automatically deployed mid servers. Once you've got the profile built and you've got the other components built, you've got this deployment request. And I'll show you this live here on an instance here in just a minute. But, but basically, you have to go in here and say, hey, here's how the deployment request looks. Here's how I want these uh, mid servers deployed. Here's the, the uh, container image to use. And, and then once you hit submit, that um, once you hit process now, it's sending that off to the the uh, deployment mid server to go get that those mid servers deployed in the Kubernetes infrastructure. It's very quick and it's a um, it's very fast. <laughs> so uh, and once you've deployed that, you can't make the, any changes to the deployment request until it's completed. And then I can show you you can actually make some tweaks after that and sync it back down to the running mid servers. So we've actually created a new operation and I'll show you that in my in the logs as it's running but we've created a new operation called Kubernetes operation probe <clears throat> which is where it's actually going out and deploying those resources right so it it accesses the Kubernetes API using a service account that that um, pod is running as and then it accesses that API and runs and does the deploy of the rest of those mid servers on the container and then the same process happens in reverse when you delete those mid servers on your instance. So when you go on to your instance and say, oh, hey, I no longer need these mid servers, it actually triggers the deployment uh, mid server to go and actually delete those deployments 
on your Kubernetes infrastructure. So, <clears throat> oh, hang on, I, I, I'm jumping ahead. So let's jump into an actual instance and I'll kind of show you the process and how I walked through and, and, and did this. So the first thing I did <clears throat> is I actually, because mid servers, when they come up, you can't give them any commands or do really do anything with them until you validate them on the instance, which is if you're deploying, you know, five or 10 mid servers in the middle of the night, so you can scale your discovery process. That's not really all that terribly useful, right? Hopefully your, your, you know, your discovery managers are asleep. So <clears throat> the idea was I used TLS mutual TLS authentication to be able to provide the TLS certificate to those new deployment mid servers and have them automatically authenticate against the instance. And when they do that, they automatically come up validated and ready to start taking um, ECC requests, essentially. So this is my deployment mid server, this cert mid here. And I'll quickly show you on my terminal, <clears throat> um, kind of what the YAML file looks like that I used to deploy that. So, <clears throat> so it's really fairly straightforward, right? <clears throat> I say, hey, I, you know, I'm here's the name. I'm going to deploy it. I'm I'm going to make it part of the mid server management app, right? <clears throat> I give it what image I want to use and what. Um, instance to connect to and where to get the PIM file for TLS authentication. And it comes up in this particular case, I'm, I, I manually am using the Azure Key Vault store, but on the rest of them I'm using the, just native Kubernetes secrets for the, the PIM certificate. So once I've got that up and deployed, now I've, I've gone through and I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump back a little bit and show you kind of the TLS certificate preparation what I did in order to get TLS certificate authentication set up was I added in, you have to go in and you have to have the root certificate. If there's an intermediate or an issuing certificate, you have to have that. And those go into this CA certificate chain um, uh, records, right? So when you go in here, the, this was an interesting component. And if you have to go and do this, I, I wanted to call this out because it hopefully will help you kind of sidestep some problems I had. You fill out these records <clears throat> and then you attach the PIM file to the record. And once it's attached, then you submit the record. And this is the important component here, this publish status. What happens is <clears throat> once you get the certificate loaded into the instance, the instance is actually fronted by a load balancer that does the TLS termination and it has to publish that's that root CA certificate into that load balancer so that that load balancer can actually handle those those TLS requests. So you have to wait you in my case because I have a, a, a root certificate and I have an intermediate certificate and then I have my client certificates. I had to wait for the root certificate to publish and become active and then I had to um, upload the intermediate certificate and wait for that to publish. And after that, I can go in and I create this user to certificates mapping. So this is where I say, hey, the user that I want to have authenticated as the mid server, right? This is your mid server user that your mid server logs into the um, ServiceNow platform with and executes command as. <clears throat> I need to map that user ID to that client certificate that I'm providing. So again, here you go, new record, right? <clears throat> you give it a name and, you know, kind of a nice mapping. You, you select which user to authenticate it to, right? <clears throat> and so in this particular case, um, I just, I, I called it cert mid just because I was, or cert auth just because I was messing with it, but uh, it's the, my, my Kubernetes certificate authentication user. <clears throat> and then again, you attach the client certificate just the certificate, not the key. You attach the certificate here, and then once that's done, it's published appropriately in a map to that user. So once you've got that completed, kind of the next step is to go and build a Kubernetes certificate. And the Kubernetes certificate, the way that you do that 
excuse me, Kubernetes secret. <clears throat> the way that you do that is you say kubectl secret create secret generic. And I just said, hey, I want to call it midsert, right? So that is the name of the secret. And then I want to ingest that from a file, right? Dash dash from dash file equals and then the file name. So that file needs to include both the certificate and the private key so that the mid server process can use the private key to ingest the certificate into the store within the, the mid server uh, container. It's really, really important of the lesson that I learned. <clears throat> so once we've got both of those in the file and in the certificate, you have to remember the name of this file, right? Because the way that it gets mounted into the, into the um, container that's running into the pod, it actually gets mounted as your mount path slash the file name that you use to ingest it into that secret. <clears throat> and I'll show you why that's important here in just a minute. Hey, hey Mike, speaking of yeah. mount path, um, Adam put a question in the Q&A asking whether or not you had to pre-create the mount path that you put in the YAML file or if Kubernetes was taking care of that for you based on yeah. what you put in there. Great question. I did not have to pre-create that mount path. That mount path does not exist in the um, in the container image. Kubernetes handles that for you and presents that whole mount path appropriately into the pod. So <clears throat> once I got that, once I got the secret set up, the next thing to do is uh, to actually make sure that you have your container image built right, which is what we talked about in last month's and and I have a blog post around how to do that. Uh, but I'm um, so I won't go back over it today. But needless to say, I built a container image and made sure that it was ready to go. <clears throat> and I published my deployment mid server using that container image and that um, <clears throat> and that YAML file that I just showed you here momentarily uh, moments ago. Once you've got the deployment mid server up, now you need to go in and you need to define your profiles for how you want the mid servers to be deployed, right? And so you need to go into mid server profiles and deployments, <clears throat> which is, is a new San Diego functionality. If you're not on San Diego, you won't see this yet, but <clears throat> there's this mid server profiles. And in here, I've just gone and built out a, a, a manual profile that says, hey, this is the URL I want to connect to. And I want to just set it up for all applications, all capabilities, all IP ranges, right? I didn't want to restrict anything. Probably not the best solution or the best design just because, you know, you may want to actually restrict it down to discovery from an application standpoint. But for this particular use case and for testing purposes, I made it simple and straightforward as possible. So once I've got that done, right? Now you go in and create your deployment request. <clears throat> so I've got these mid deployment requests and it keeps a record of these deployment requests. This was one that I did earlier in testing, <clears throat> but you can go in here and you can say, I'm going to duplicate this deployment request. So I'll, I'll do that just so you can see kind of how, what the process looks like. So you name the deployment request and you tell it, hey, this is the mid-server profile that I want to deploy as part of this deployment request. <clears throat> Here is the uh, image repository path and the image tag to use, which you'll, you'll notice matches what I had listed in my, um, <clears throat> in my YAML file for the deployment mid-server. And then there's three tabs down here on the bottom that really control how that those mid-servers are deployed, right? So there's a, the naming convention prefix and then how many of them you want, right? So it's gonna actually do an auto naming configuration where it'll, it'll iterate through, you know, it starts off with, you know, mid case 0001 and continues to increment. So, <clears throat> which you'll see here in a minute. And then you add in the cluster info. So in this particular case, um, the most important things that I changed here is the name of the secret that I created in 
my kubectl create secret command. So this is the name of the secret, and then this is the path that I want it mounted as, plus the file name that I used to ingest into Kubernetes for that secret, right? Super important. If you don't get the file name on the tail end there, <clears throat> then it won't actually know which component to ingest out of that secret because you could have multiple different files in that secret. So um, once that's completed, you can, oh yeah, the next one is you can specify which mid server to use for the deployment process, right? <clears throat> so in this particular case, I've already built my deployment mid server. And so I just said, hey, I'm gonna specify that one deployment mid server to make sure there's no questions about mid selection process. Now, because I copied this from another um, <clears throat> from another deployment request, it's not going to deploy anything. You'll notice the state is still at new, right? It's not going to deploy anything. There's two options here. One, you can export it to a YAML file. So this is, hey, I want to actually deploy this, but I want to make some tweaks to the YAML file first manually before I go and deploy these mid servers. And so you can export it to a YAML file and then go to do the deploy yourself. This is maybe you have a different secrets driver that you need to add in, um, or you may have a private um, image repo that you need to add in authentication for so that it can actually download the images. So you may want to do it that way. The other option is, hey, I've got everything I need. I'm just going to go ahead and hit process now. So I'll go ahead and hit process now. And that's going to actually go out and deploy three mid servers on my Kubernetes cluster. And so we'll go over to the logs for my mid server. And you'll see that this is this new operation called uh, Kubernetes operation probe. So let's kick that off. And you'll also see that it's completed almost immediately, right? <clears throat> very, very quickly. And then we'll go and look at We now have three deployments with three new mid servers that are up and running. And we'll go back to my instance. And you'll notice this has already set this field to complete. If we reload that, it's complete. Here's the total operations. Here's all the information around kind of how that all worked. And then I'll go look over at the mid servers and you'll see that they've come up and they're already validated and ready to start taking um, <clears throat> ECCQ requests because they've got that TLS certificate and they've got mutual off running already. So they're all ready to go. And then we can go through and, and delete them from here, or we could go in and we could change the profile and reconfigure the mid servers to say, hey, we're only gonna do this or we're only gonna do that. And, and so as a result, then you can go back and you can resync that profile out to the already running mids and get that working. So pretty quickly, I went from just one deployment mid server to, hey, I've got you know three more mid servers ready to go and start discovering stuff. We could probably scale that much larger. The, the recommendation in the documentation says we probably shouldn't do more than 10 mid servers at a time per request, but Given how quickly that ran, I'm, I'm kind of surprised about that, that 10 limitation. So thoughts, questions, anything that's come up while I was running through that demo? Nothing in the chat or the Q&A. Is this something that might potentially be useful for folks on the call? I saw something pop up. Yeah, Adam has a question about what it does under the covers. I think it's creating a deployment. You could probably sh take a look at the YAML file and see specifically. Yep, I'll show you. So it,
Thank you for that feedback, Darshan. Okay. I appreciate that. There you go. So that's the YAML file. So you can see what it's doing here, right? Here's the configuration URL. Here's its profile ID. And here's, here's where it's mounting that PIM file. Here's the deployment name. So it's gone through and it's built out this YAML file. It's deployed it all out into the infrastructure and it does it all automatically. And if you want, um, we can actually go look at, good. Uh, let's see here, describe. Okay, so a couple of questions coming up here. So Bob, you asked, can PDIs be set up to do the TLS part? Um, that's a really good question. I've never tried to do that. Um, so we might, that might be a support question, honestly. <clears throat> I can make a note. We can kind of do some legwork and see. Yep. I know you, you've made friends with a couple of the, uh, the TLS developers at this point. So yep. we might, we might be able to uh, get some insight there. And then as far as hardware recommendations for setting up Kubernetes clusters at home to test this out with, um, I can tell you what I'm running on, right? Like I've got a three node Intel nut cluster at home um, that I am running vSphere on and then Kubernetes on top of that. Uh, that is purely because of my VMware background. Um, you can probably go a lot leaner and a lot cheaper. I mean, I know I had no friends who are running clusters of Raspberry Pis with multiple Kubernetes nodes on them, right? So um, it's really kind of a question of what works best for you and your budget. Will, thoughts there? Yeah, I've done a couple different things. Um, if I just need to test something quick with Kubernetes, I do like Minikube. Just, yeah. you know, that can run basically anywhere, whether it's uh, like a virtual box Linux VM on a, you know, on a, a modest uh, desktop or laptop computer. Um, I like the, uh, I do like the cloud, the, the different cloud-based Kubernetes offerings. I found, I actually did, I did a exercise and, and wrote a, a community article on spinning up a, uh, a Windows-based container mid. And um, those of you who have played with Kubernetes probably know Windows containers are not for the faint of heart. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna go Windows, I would say Azure. If, if you have access to Azure at all, that's the best way to do Kubernetes Windows containers. Um, you know, we do still, because um, we don't use the cross-platform PowerShell for any of our stuff yet. If you want to run PowerShell stuff, you have to have a Windows mid. So you can you can do a containerized Windows mid, um, but there are a lot of caveats with doing that. And I found that was most readily accomplished via via Azure. Great question. Yeah, Mike's yeah. Mike was doing all Linux mids, but you can, and basically everything Mike did, you can do with Windows. I mean, it's really just a function of what uh, image you're selecting. And and I I have built Windows mid images. They are, they're pretty big. Hmm. Um, Windows, Windows, because they, they, you know, they're based on the Windows, the base Windows container image, which is essentially, you know, a s somewhat skinny down Windows, OS image. Um, I don't know of a way, like with Linux containers, a lot of times you can strip like everything away. And I don't know if that's feasible with Windows, but you can, but you can do it. And it, I found it, it, it worked fine. So <clears throat> let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the mid profiler that um, well made. So one of the things that we came up with 
was, hey, we have to manually make these profiles. So Will, why don't you kind of talk about what your goal was and how you went through that? Absolutely. So when this uh, capability was announced, Mike got all fired up. He's like, oh man, I'm going to dig into this. I'm going to you know, set this up. We'll do an article. We'll do a session. Um, I was looking at the instructions and, and I realized that there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of tabs on that Windows profile screen. And if you've got to do that multiple times, that, that could get a little tedious. And then because I, you know, if I have to do something more than two, three times by hand, I generally, my, my mind just kind of gravitates towards, hey, could we automate this? It turns out we can. So the way I did it was um, just went into studio, I created a scoped app, and then I built some stuff using Flow Designer. And because I did it as a scoped app, it was really easy to pop it out into uh, a Git repo. And so the links to that, as well as the community article that I wrote on, um, on how I put the, the different flows together will be available in this deck there on this slide. And, and as Mike said, we'll send out a, a copy of this deck to all the attendees today. So you can, you can go and check that out. It's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's meant to be an example, but it, it's pretty solid. Um, I'll just kind of give you a little bit of a look at it here. Let me stop sharing and you can share. Yeah, I'll grab the share here. Okay. Uh, so here's the Git repo. Um, again, if you haven't used Studio, it's a really great way to encapsulate, you know, a piece of work that you're doing in the platform. And then as an added benefit, you can pop it into a Git repo and that get, you know, as long as you're um, fastidious about pushing out your commits, you can, you know, really kind of, it gives you that ability to rewind in case you updated some stuff in Studio that you didn't mean to update, deleted a bunch of things or, or what have you. So I chose to do this using uh, a fairly low code approach. Um, I did a little bit of legwork. So one of the things that I looked at was, okay, what's going on under the covers as we're managing these, these mid profiles? And it led me to this script include called mid server profile. And this contains a bunch of JavaScript utility functions that are running under the behind the scenes and they are what does the work when you say, hey, I want to spin up a mid based on this profile. They basically copy a bunch of records from the profile tables into the mid server tables. And so what I did to create a mid profiler was I just kind of reversed that process and just kind of flipped the source and destination and created some subflows that would take those tables say, okay, what, you know, give me all the records from this table for a given mid and then copy them over into the profile table. So this was kind of, this, this was just a little bit of, you know, behind the scenes legwork that I did to kind of get some insight into like table names that I needed to be looking at as well as um, down here, it was kind of uh, interesting. There are certain parameters that, you know, kind of individualize a mid server and so those are, it, it actually won't let you put those parameters into a mid profile so that you don't inadvertently overwrite some mid server record for a, a, a mid that already exists. And, and so armed with that, I just went into studio and just created this little, uh, this little app, which has basically got a bunch of flows. Ah, good old demo instances, so responsive. Right. So basically what I created was a, a flow that just takes an existing mid server reference as an input. 
uh, checks to see if it's Windows or Linux. If it's Win, because there is one, uh, most of the information about MIDs are stored in your instance, but there's one piece that isn't, which is the wrapper override config. And that's where you put things like if you want to increase your Java heap size, you put those in the, you put that kind of thing in the wrapper override config. And I wanted to capture that as well. So I just built a couple steps, uh, a couple actions. One is a PowerShell action that pulls that file, the contents of that override file from a Windows mid. And then one is an SSH action that pulls the contents of that file from a Linux mid and then pulls it into a flow variable. And then I fed that into another action that basically parses that and generates records inside the corresponding uh, Windows, um, excuse me, mid profile subtable, if you will. And, and then for each of those other tables, I just created a subflow that queries all the records from each table that correspond to the mid that I select that I want to profile and just copies the records from the mid table into the mid profile table. And again, I, I kind of get into a fair amount of detail in the community article and um, the uh, Git repo can be, you'd want to clone that Git repo and then you can create a, a scoped app within your own non-prod instance and pull in, uh, pull in all the code from your copy, your clone of that Git repo. So an example of what that looks like. I'll just put that, um, let's see. I just kind of put a simple catalog item on the front end of it, just for demonstration purposes. So all I do is just select a mid. And order it. And so we can kind of see the flow running behind the scenes. And so this kind of this simple flow is kicked off by the catalog item and then it runs the kind of the main subflow. We can see that's already completed. And then if I browse my mid profiles, and I just have it create a mid profile that's named after the mid that's used as the example. And so what that flow did was it just kind of populated this profile based on a combination of the override wrapper settings that were in the wrapper file, the wrapper override file on the actual server, plus all of the different configuration, property settings. Uh, this one happens to be in a cluster, so copies that information over as well. And I did, since I'm demonstrating this, I did pick specific applications that the mid server would select, would uh, support specific capabilities and a specific IP range that I wanted to apply. And it just copies all of that. I mean, at our heart, we're a database. And so it makes this kind of thing very easy. And with, um, with Flow Designer, it's all, um, it, it can be done without having to write any code. Uh, if you wanted to write code, you could certainly, I could have done this probably, to be honest, more quickly with JavaScript because I'm more of a kind of command line coder type person, but I find it's a lot easier to kind of see what's going on by doing it within Flow Designer and exposing kind of those individual steps. Any questions? So we did have one pop up in the Q&A that I left for you because you've messed with the Windows containers way more than I have. Any special requirements for log on as a service user in a Windows containerized mid? Yeah, um, my experience is it took care of that. Um, the Docker recipe that they use to generate the image that includes the requisite. I, I just took the default. I let it create the default user. Um, I didn't have to, um, I did not have to do anything special to kind of add that. Like when I'm, I have experienced that when I'm doing a Windows Server, uh, Windows Mid by hand, I've got to create the user and make sure it's got that log on as a service permission. Um, 
I did not have to do anything special to get the the containerized Windows Mid to do that. And if you haven't seen it, if you look on a Rome or later instance in the mid server downloads, there is a, um, a Linux container recipe and a Windows container recipe. Yeah, that's been available since um, Rome. So the once you get to once you get to at least Rome, you'll have access to those um, Docker recipes, which basically just gives you a Docker file. And um, I'll include a I'll I'll include the link to the article that I did on on pipelining the uh, and and Mike has an article on kind of the build process. I did an article on pipelining uh, the mid server um, container image build. And we'll include both of those links in our follow-up email that includes the slide deck. Yeah, it, I have you know, basically gives you an example of, of how to actually kind of take this um, kind of raw material and, and, and turn it into a, a, a container image for a mid-server. I've already found the, uh, um, <clears throat> the, the pipelining to be an important process because as I was going through and building out this uh, automated mid-server deployment process, we actually updated my instance so the images that i was building off of were now no longer valid for the instance and i had to go through the upgrade process and i didn't want to have to deal with that so i, I triggered off my pipeline and and built out the the newer version of the mid server that matched my my new instance and that that helped significantly okay well we're bumping right up against the top of the hour and um mike and i think can certainly hang out if there's any um, remaining questions. Also, if you have any additional follow-up questions or uh, suggestions for future sessions, format, et cetera, different beers, you want us to try whatever, um, feel free to, to email us. Our contact information is, um, you know, we'll, we'll definitely be available in the, uh, you know, the follow-up email. Um, I did put up a, a, an exit poll, if you'd be so kind as to give us some feedback that way as well. That would be great. And um, yeah, if there aren't any other questions, we'll adjourn. We'll give it a couple minutes in case anybody wants to raise their hand or put something in the chat for the QA. Uh, Bob's asking about the GA for Cloud Native Ops. We've heard a uh, fairly fuzzy third, fourth quarter. Um, it feels like if customers ask for it loudly that could accelerate so um if you you know if you need uh assistance getting the right channel through which to ask for that vociferously feel free to reach out to us otherwise you can certainly uh, consult your account team on how to um you know how how, how to make make service now aware that you're very interested in, in cloud native ops I'm going through now and allowing everyone to talk. So if you would like to come off of mute and ask any questions you want, anything related to kind of what we talked about today, you know, don't hesitate, don't be shy. And actually we can stop recording as well that way. Uh-oh, going off the record. That's always dangerous. Yep, going off record. <laughs>